for a gamer of a certain vintage, there's something odd about seeing a 3DFX logo appear on an arcade cabinet. And yet, their Voodoo cards were in arcades from their first GPU in 1996, in games such as Atari's San Francisco Rush. Their 3D accelerators weren't designed just for home computers, they were designed for anything and everything that needed their 3D rendering power. And today I want to show you one such example in which home computers and arcades collide with a 3DFX cherry on the top. This is the Taito Wolf system from 1997. At first glance, it's oddly familiar. There's a Socket 7 CPU. And next to that, we can see IDE ports, just as we'd have found on home PCs of the day. Taito Wolf was designed to be low cost, adaptable, and reusable in the late 90s arcades. And yet, despite all of those goals, only one game was ever released for it. And we will take a look at that game a little bit later. But first, I want to take a look at the hardware and figure out why it is both alien and so very familiar to an old PC gamer such as myself. The game hosted on this board is Taito's Psychic Force 2012 from 1998. It's a sequel to 95's Psychic Force, and that earlier game was based on Taito's FX1A hardware. Now that earlier hardware was an arcade board based on Sony PlayStation hardware. Why reinvent it if something suitable is already out there and available? This wasn't like the 1980s where you had to design and fabricate a custom chip to push the boundaries of 3D simply because nobody had done it before. The processing power was in your home consoles, it was mass produced, and that saved time and money bringing a new arcade game to market. And that cost cutting approach is exactly what this Taito Wolf tries to achieve. So let's take a look at the hardware now, starting with the motherboard, which is the bottom of the three layers. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, and injection molding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com, and we thank them for their support. What we have here is a regular old beige box PC. It could just as well be in a Dell computer of the time. The motherboard is a P5TXLA by Taiwanese manufacturer ECS, but they appear to have built this to a custom spec. That customization being, leave a load of stuff off of the board, please. For example, there's a gap where we'd normally find the onboard ATI 3D Rage video card and it's four megabytes of video memory. It has a regular award BIOS, although we don't see any sign of that BIOS screen flashing up when we boot up. And we're missing ports on the rear, including the VGA, USB and a mouse port. Only a PS2 keyboard port appears to be there, serial and parallel. And we don't need to plug anything into these. Now I don't have an English service manual for this board. I couldn't find one, so I couldn't tell you if the remaining ports are there for some kind of troubleshooting reason. Maybe you can plug a keyboard in and get some kind of terminal output from it to troubleshoot. Um, if you happen to have an English service manual, please do let me know because I'd love to read it and find out what this is all about or if it was just cheaper in manufacturing to leave those ports on there. On the motherboard, I also found a 16 megabyte memory module, which wasn't a great deal of RAM for a PC of the day, but the game is stored on ROMs as we'll see later, so it doesn't really need a huge amount of RAM. Intrigued as to what CPU this is using, I had to take a heat gun to it because the fan and heat sink on top of the CPU had been hot glued in place. I get it, this would have been thrown haphazardly into an arcade cabinet. You wouldn't want parts vibrating out of their sockets, although I'm sure the heat sink bracket would have held it in just fine. Let's pop the CPU out and we can see it's actually an Intel Pentium with MMX technology. Flipping it over reveals that it's a 200 MHz model, and that too is a regular consumer CPU, just as you would have found in your Packard Bell back in the day. I did find an unexpected surprise though. If we take a look under the heatsink, the blue film is still there on the thermal paste. So that was doing a less than perfect job of dissipating the heat away from the CPU. I wonder how many more were glued in place like that from the factory. Still, it saves me a job of applying new thermal paste we can just reuse what's on there. And while we're at it, we might as well give it a clean. I brushed through the fans, might as well show a bit of respect for the old dog if it survived this long.
there it is, all clean with the RAM back in place. What's missing from this PC are expansion slots, you'll notice. There's no PCI, ISA slots, etc. And that's because it used a riser, the long brown slot in the middle. You would put a riser in there and that would provide you with your expansion slots to fit the form factor of the PC. But with the Wolf system, this is where we break away from the traditional desktop PC and the arcade magic begins. We move on to level two now, this board with the lovely Taito branding on the silk screen. And looking around it, the first thing that stands out for me is the 3DFX chips. Two of them sat atop it. What these chips represent is the equivalent of a 3DFX Voodoo One card. The same GPU that was considered current in our home PCs at the time. In fact, when the one game on this hardware came out, Voodoo Two cards were coming about. The 3DFX chips would provide hardware-assisted anti-aliasing, perspective-corrected texture mapping, bilinear filtering, all of the grunt and features needed to present a cutting edge 3D game and tempt you to put your cash into the arcade machine. And those 3DFX chips are supported by six megabytes of video memory. We also find on here the Taito ZFX2 DSP and a ZSG2 sound chip. So there's no creative sound blaster card on here as we would have found in our PCs. This is what's known as the Taito Zoom sound system. And it wasn't exclusive to this setup. You'd find it in other Taito arcade hardware, including their power PC-based system, which ran Operation Tiger, a 1998 game, fourth in the Operation Wolf series. Yeah, I had no idea about that one either, but it's a thing apparently and not a great one at that. Regardless, the sound system is shared across Taito platforms. A jammer edge connector is being used to plug right into the harness of an arcade cabinet, and that feeds the system's audio and video output to the cabinet, while receiving control input, power, so the whole thing is powered through the jammer connector here, and that feeds down into the motherboard, and the coin mechanism input, so it knows if a coin's been inserted and a credit has been applied. It's nice and convenient for your chain-smoking, grumpy arcade operator of the period to pop into a machine and quickly have it up and running. There's also a secondary DC barrel jack, which appears to give it a bit more juice if your cabinet isn't up to the job, Again, it's hard to know without an English service manual, but the board works with nothing plugged into that, so I think it's safe for us to ignore today. We have our CPU, we have our RAM, we have our 3D and multimedia capabilities, now we need our game. And we find that on level 3, the top PCB here. This board is awash with ROMs, bustling with sprites, music and game data. It connects to the stack of PCBs using these lovely chunky Euro card connectors on the underside. And when I checked the main ROM dumps, because the ROMs are dumped and out there, but I don't think the Taito Wolf system is fully emulated at this point. It tells me that it houses 10 8 megabyte ROMs, one 4 megabyte, two 2 megabyte, two 512K, three 256K and one 128K ROM. Four of them socketed EPROMs, so you could quickly wipe and update some parts of the game easily, although you could also socket all of the other ROMs and swap them out if you wanted to. What I do love about this whole setup is seeing that Taito logo, whether it's on the ROM chips, whether it's on the silk screen. It just reminds me of an illustrious history over the decades and what Taito has brought to the arcade gaming industry. However, does this game meet their high standards? Is this a Taito smash hit? Well, let's play the game and find out. For the first test of this board, I used my Super Gun. This is a board that slots into a Jammer arcade board and gives you RGB SCART output. It's powered by a regular ATX PSU, and around the front, it's got a couple of joypad ports into which you're supposed to plug Neo Geo sticks. There's my problem. I don't have any Neo Geo joypads or arcade sticks or a DE9 to Neo Geo adapter, but that's okay because behold, my homemade Neo Geo joypad. Perhaps the least ergonomic joypad ever invented, and no, those are not genuine Sandware arcade parts. 
but it will get the job done. So in it goes, as does power, and now let's turn it on. On first test, it went into the service menu and it was all in Japanese. I can't see any dip switches on the hardware itself to change settings, nor could I find any language settings within the menus. That's not to say the game will be unplayable, it would just be nice to read all of the text in English and understand what's going on. The game does run, although my super gun is giving it a slightly red tinge to the video output. There's three pots on the super gun to fix the colour and tweak it, and my blue pot seems to be broken, so I'll come back to that another day. It's good enough to show that the board works and the colour issues are not to do with the board. As luck would have it, I do have some spare parts for this board, including a slightly sticky looking ROM board with the windows exposed on the EEPROMs. So let's give this one a go. The first we tried was version 2.040J and this board just comes up as 2.040 without the J for Japanese and now everything is in English. Perfect. But to give it a proper playthrough, I thought I'd take a trip downstairs to the Arcade Archive. It's our public arcade here, which you can come and visit if you fancy a day out, curated by Alex, who wasn't in today, so I snuck in while he wasn't around and I put a board into one of his generic jammer cabinets. What can I say about Psychic Force 2012 then? The graphics are smooth, beautifully shaded and textured, it's colourful, and it really does benefit from those 3DFX chips. In this cabinet, it looks lovely, and I'm sure it would be even more impressive in something like Taito's Egret arcade cabinet with a 29-inch CRT screen. We should remind ourselves that it was just five years earlier that we saw the filled polygons of Virtua Fighter in the arcades using Sega's custom hardware, and since we'd seen the rise of 3D fighting games. The difference with this Psychic 4 series is that your feet aren't planted on the floor. You're flying around an invisible cube. I guess you're using your Psychic Forces to do that while slapping each other silly. As a game, it's not something I really enjoy. It's not something I would put the time into. This doesn't appeal to me, this kind of genre of game. But I might try one of the home ports to see if that has some more depth to it to draw me in a little bit more. Dreamcast, PlayStation and PC versions of this game were all released, and of course the PC version included 3DFX Glide support, although a subsequent re-release dropped it and supported DirectX only. It also appeared in a 2006 anniversary pack on the PlayStation 2, and it was ported within the arcades. In 2012 it was re-released on Taito's Type X2 hardware, and that was part of its Nessica X Live, I think I'm saying that right, this was a system that they created to distribute games online and make them downloadable to arcade operators. So a new version for that hardware was released in 2012. Across the board, reviews are fairly positive overall, but it was never seen as a genre-defining game and it wasn't seen to push boundaries. It was just a fairly nice fighter. So it's a fairly average game, but I wanted to show you this today because I thought it was a really interesting insight to that period of arcade gaming when the balance of power, the shift was nearly complete, when you no longer needed to go to an arcade to see the latest and greatest 3D graphics, because you may well have had exactly the same hardware at home, and within a couple of years you would have had even greater hardware at home when this thing was still sat in an arcade trying to tempt money out of you. You just didn't need to go to an arcade to see it. And I've not been able to confirm this myself, but I've read that it's actually running a version of MS-DOS underneath it all, which would make sense, MS-DOS with the Glide API to power those 3DFX cards, and it might explain why there's a mysterious Microsoft sticker here on the board. And while I'm focusing on this one Taito Wolf setup today, it was far from the only board that had a 3DFX chip on it. Take a look at this slightly later board. This is Golden T4, that's four as in golf, or not the number four. This is different to the Taito board. It's not based on Pentium processors or an x86 architecture. It uses the same CPU as the Nintendo 64 paired up with a PCI Voodoo 3000. I dare say you could probably take that card out, put it straight into your PC and it would work, although I will double check before shoving that into a vintage machine. Golden T4 came out in 2002 and it 
does have the slight advantage of using a trackball. Now you could obviously get a trackball at home, but it wasn't commonplace. So you would at least get a slightly different experience in terms of the control method if you tried this in an arcade. And that's what arcades had to do in the noughties to fight for your attention. They couldn't fight on a hardware front, so they had to introduce quirky control methods, giant cabinets, all of those kinds of things that we saw and they tried and ultimately failed and we ended up with the arcades um, or the uh, ticket dispensing machines that we see in arcades today. It all went downhill very quickly. However, I just wanted to share the Taito Wolf system from our storeroom with you today because it's just such an interesting piece of hardware and window into that period of arcade gaming. And it tells a story which isn't unlike the direction consoles have been going in recent years as they adopt a slightly more PC-like architecture and the differences between them become less and it's more about the exclusives and the games that you can get on your platform of choice. And next we'll move towards an online only streaming generation of video games and all of that will become irrelevant once again. The March of Progress. An interesting insight into the late 90s nonetheless. That's the Taito Wolf system. And um, as I said, if anyone out there has got an English service manual for me, please do let me know. I hope you've enjoyed our episode today and our look at this. Don't forget, you can come and try games at the Arcade Archive, although I can't guarantee this game will be plugged in. I don't think there's a huge demand for it, but I'm, I could drag out the super gun perhaps. And you could play on my very special <laughs> joypad if you really want to, and everything else that the cave has to offer. Head to retrocollective.co.uk where you can book yourself a ticket and you can come and hang out and visit and try everything out. Take care and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.